Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. The economy is affecting real estate in some interesting ways now. Vital trends revealed from a survey of single-family landlords. Then the heart of today's show is every debt that you have worth paying off. The answer is no, with some surprising reasons, all today on Get Rich Education. When you want the best real estate and finance info, the modern internet experience limits your free articles access and it's replete with paywalls and you've got pop-ups and push notifications and cookies disclaimers. Ugh, at no other time in history has it been more vital to place nice, clean, free content into your hands that actually adds no hype value to your life. See, this is the golden age of quality newsletters, and I write every word of ours myself. It's got a dash of humor, and it's to the point. To get the letter, it couldn't be more simple. Text GRE to 66866, and when you start the free newsletter, you'll also get my one-hour fast real estate course completely free. It's called the Don't Quit Your Daydream Letter, and it wires your mind for wealth. Make sure you read it. Text GRE to 66866. Text GRE to 66866. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE. You are listening to The Voice of Real Estate Investing since 2014. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, back to help you build your wealth for another week. This is Get Rich Education. That's just one of many things that makes this show different from other shows or just consuming news stories. Here, you stay updated on important real estate investing trends, but you learn specific strategies to actionably build your wealth. That's the difference, and it's with the most generationally proven medium of real estate, all without you having to be a flipper and often not a landlord either. Now, presidential candidates make lots of promises during their campaigns. That includes with real estate here recently. Even if you're listening 10 years from now, I'll tell you how to put something like this into perspective. Kamala Harris unveiled her plan to spur the construction of 3 million more housing units. That's a good thing. America needs more housing. She also wants to give federal assistance. <clears throat> and by the way, that means your money. Uh, she wants to give federal assistance in the form of a $25,000 down payment help for first-time homebuyers. I see that is a bad thing. And see, there's no partisan bias here at GRE. A lot of media outlets, they will filter something like this as all good or all bad because they get better ratings when they rile people up. And that results in a divided America. <laughs> but the problem is that the 25K of down payment help, that can be delivered faster than new homes can be built. And that risks pushing up home prices faster, sooner, which erodes the very affordability that's trying to be helped here. Now, a presidential candidate, be it Kamala Harris or anyone, when they have this enthusiasm to also limit price gouging at grocery stores here, like this candidate does, I mean, that's the beginning of price controls. And when there are price controls, no farmer is going to want to produce cherry tomatoes or Fisher is going to want to produce wild-caught salmon if they have a significant price ceiling limiting the supply of those things, therefore. I mean, when we had price controls in the high inflation 70s, that created shortages. And it's important to keep in mind that presidential campaign promises, they often don't become policies that are enacted, even if that person is elected president. And even if they are, much of this still requires congressional approval and we still have a divided Congress. And any tax changes require the approval of Congress. So really, this stuff is just a presidential wish list, giving you some perspective here. 
Now, on the topic of shortages, there still is not enough available supply of U.S. homes, active listings. Those seeking a starter home often get more worn out than your grandpa after two games of checkers. <laughs> but inventory levels are not as bad as they used to be. We still got a ways to go to claw back close to a more normal, balanced, pre-pandemic housing supply level Nationally, we are still 29% lower. There are now still 29% fewer active listings than there were in pre-pandemic times. And most individual states still have inventory levels lower than that too. Compared to five years ago, when we break it down by state, some have a more paltry supply than others. The places with the scarcest inventory... They seem to be those states where maple syrup gets produced, <laughs> as it turns out. And I sure hope that this doesn't mean people need to sleep in the sugar shack. Connecticut is down 75%. That means they have 75% less inventory than five years ago pre-pandemic. Illinois down 66%. New Jersey down 57%. Virginia down 53%. Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Michigan, all with 51% less inventory than they had pre-pandemic. Ohio down 43%. California and Missouri each down 31%. The main problem here is that the Northeast and Midwest have not had enough home building in order to keep up with housing demand. I guess what, there were too many snow days in the Northeast and Midwest? Or were builders constantly distracted by potholes and cicadas? <laughs> Conversely, there are three popular investor states where for sale inventory is just a tad higher now than it was five years ago. Texas is up 6%, Florida up 5%, Tennessee up 2%. And this doesn't mean that these states are oversupplied with housing. It just means that they have a touch more than they did in 2019. So they're closer to balance. The important overall thing to remember here is, of course, that nationally, buyers still outnumber sellers. So between the lower mortgage rates that we've had in the past year and the low supply, this keeps the environment ripe. There will be more offers and more potential for home prices to increase faster then its current rate of 4.1%, that 4.1% year over year is per the NAR, it's important for you to understand that there's virtually no way that prices can revert to their pre-pandemic levels. Home prices are not going back to where they used to be five years ago. In fact, there is more pressure on them to rise from here, not fall. And there are a few reasons why prices cannot go back to where they were. The rate of inflation has slowed. You've seen the price of lumber come down. But wider inflation has been indelibly baked into the pricing cake. Homes now have higher, permanently embedded costs of labor, materials, and land that all have more stick to to them than Simone Biles on the balance beam. <laughs> Prices are not coming down anytime in the near future. You might remember that right here on this show and in our newsletter, back in late December, eight months ago, I forecast that national home prices would rise 4% this year, and I still really like how that looks. I'll get back to the investment side here shortly, but real quick, in light of the new rules about how real estate agents are compensated, if you're about to buy a primary residence, you may not have any experience negotiating with a broker. In last week's newsletter, I sent you a template you can use, and that can help you simplify the process as a buyer and help you avoid being taken advantage of. I sent you that template last Thursday. Back here on the real estate investor side, after a high tide of inflation, you know, you and I, we have all surely enjoyed the splash of both higher property prices and rents. That looks to continue. But what about your higher property expenses too? Let's talk about what you've 
got to do to avoid getting crunched by expenses. A survey of single-family landlords was recently conducted by Lending One and Resi Club, and they asked this question, what is your expense that increased the most the past 12 months? The number one answer is fast-rising insurance premiums, with half of respondents citing that as their biggest expense increase item. And that's hardly a new development, not surprising. The next biggest expense was property tax. 27% of respondents cited that. And that's mostly a reflection of higher property values and their consequent tax assessments. 235 single family landlords completed this survey, by the way. So they were the proportion of landlords that answered about what was their fastest increasing expense. Half of them said insurance, easily the most. Well, the rate of increase in homeowners insurance costs was roughly 10 to 12 percent nationally last year. That's according to the Insurance Information Institute. And the top two reasons for this are more severe storms and higher replacement costs. The good news is that further rate increases are cooling off, though. All right, but still, what are you to do as a rental property owner that's stuck with a higher property insurance bill? I've got a great answer for you, and it's so incredibly simple. You pass the expense along to your tenant with a rent increase. And then others can deal with what happens downstream from there. And I'll tell you how to go about doing this shortly, which is also so incredibly simple. But if you're reluctant to pass along the increased insurance expense to your tenant, understand that you and your tenant are just like two ports along a river as this wave of inflation flows along. It flows from the reinsurer to the insurer to you, the property owner, to the increased rent to the hike in the tenant's wage to the employer, and then the employer hikes prices on the consumer. That's how the river flows. No watered down returns for you. Now, of course, this river's headwaters are sourced with the government because that's where inflation comes from. Inflation means an expansion of the money supply. You and your tenant are really two ports along the river don't let the expense water dam up and flood you. And the written reason that you give your tenant for the rent increase is, drum roll here, higher insurance costs. Yeah, that's it. It's super simple. There's no need to be inventive here. Honesty is therefore the best river raft. <laughs> hey, come on now. This remorseless geography degree holder has got to let loose with something like river references from time to time. <laughs> so that's the greatest expense increase item, what to do about it and how you should go about doing it. Now, this same survey of single family landlords, they showed that 76% expect to reach high watermarks <laughs> and raise the rent over the next 12 months, including 35% of landlords who say the rent increase will be over 4%. And planned rent increases of 1% to 7% are most common. That's the planned rent increase range, 1% to 7%. Look, you didn't get into real estate to subsidize others' living expenses. There is nothing unethical about adjusting to market-level rent. Rent hikes are like a lock lifting your ship through the Panama Canal. All right, so what do we make of this? I mean, gauging overall investor sentiment as we head later into the 2020s decade, what is the landlord temperature as I see it? Expenses are up, higher rents follow, and last quarter, home values increased in almost 90% of U.S. metro markets. Yes, property values are up in 89% of metro markets. But how do single-family landlords in this same survey feel? Well, 60% of them say they will buy at least one investment property 
over the next 12 months. So most single family landlords, they want to buy more. And when that's broken down by region, the most single family real estate investor optimism is in the Midwest, Northeast, and South. And really, single family landlords are optimistic in every region except the West. And this makes sense. Cash flows are less lucrative in the West because prices have long outpaced rents there. The survey really shows that most aren't wildly bullish or excessively bearish on the real estate market. They expect it to stay balanced. Many plan to buy properties, raise rents, and the survey shows that they too expect a 4% home price appreciation rate. That's what it showed. And they anticipate falling interest rates. Now, personally, I often disagree with what the masses think. I mean, contrarians to the mainstream, they are often the profiteers. But in this case, I guess I'm more agreeable with the survey respondents than a perfectly brewed cup of coffee in the morning. (laughs) And well, maybe that's because single family landlords, the very people that were surveyed, are not mainstream. The housing market is actually pretty normal in most every significant way, except, of course, the ongoing lack of housing inventory and affordability challenges for first-time homebuyers. And if you're a newer GRE listener, even normal times can be thrilling for a real estate investor when you achieve a 40% plus total rate of return from how real estate pays you five ways Yes, if you're new here, I know that sounds like an unachievable return, but 40% plus is actually realistic without high risk when you understand your five simultaneous profit sources with income producing property. In fact, when someone asks why you invest in real estate, you can just hold up five fingers. The broader economy shows a lot of signs of normalcy as well. GDP growth, consumer spending, unemployment, the inflation rate. But the sad exception here is this widening gap between the wealthy and the poor. So I guess that more people charter yachts and yet others increasingly pour Mountain Dew on their Fruit Loops in the morning for breakfast. (laughs) Now, complete uncertainty never disappears, but after disruptions from COVID, high inflation, and new wars, a lot of people see calmer times ahead. Elections matter, but some people seem more concerned about who the next president will be than the parent of a Sephora-obsessed teen. (laughs) Presidential elections aren't known to rock the real estate market, and actually history shows that the more sensitive stock market is only temporarily affected by an election. Sometimes I just ponder and quietly think to myself, hmm, when the liquid death drink brand thrives from hawking wildly overpriced water in a can, I posit just how bad can the economy really be? (laughs) The bottom line is that most single family investors are meeting higher insurance expenses with rent increases and they want to buy more income property over the next 12 months. Hey, if you like the show here and you get value from it every week, I love it when you just simply tell a friend about the show. It's as easy as having them download our dedicated Get Rich Education mobile app for both iOS and Android. If you think you have any friends that would benefit from the vital episode here, I'd be grateful if you shared the show with them. Use the share button on your podcatcher or even take a screenshot and post it to your social Straight ahead is any debt worth paying off. I'm Keith Weinhold. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Hey, you can get your mortgage loans at the same place where I get mine at Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. They've provided our listeners with more loans than any provider in the entire nation because they specialize in income properties. They help you build a long-term plan for growing your real estate empire with leverage You can start your pre-qualification and chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. Start now while it's on your mind at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's RidgeLendingGroup.com. Your bank is getting rich off of you. The national average bank account pays less than 1% on your savings. 
If your money isn't making 4%, you're losing your hard-earned cash to inflation. Let the liquidity fund help you put your money to work with minimum risk. Your cash generates up to an 8% return with compound interest year in and year out instead of earning less than 1% sitting in your bank account. The minimum investment is just 25 k You keep getting paid until you decide you want your money back. Their decade-plus track record proves they've always paid their investors 100% in full and on time. And I would know because I'm an investor too. Earn 8%, hundreds of others are. Text FAMILY to 66866. Learn more about Freedom Family Investments Liquidity Fund on your journey to financial freedom through passive income. Text FAMILY to 66866. This is Freedom Family Investments co-founder, Danny Lynn Robinson. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. You're listening to episode 516. Is every debt that you have worth paying off? The short answer is no. I have held millions of dollars in debt from a young age, and I just keep holding on to more and more. Look, what happens to your net worth when you pay down one of your debts? Absolutely nothing happens to your net worth. It stays the same. All right, say that the total value of all of your assets gives you a sum of one and a half million dollars. That's the combined value of any of your Real estate, cars, retirement accounts, gold, Bitcoin, all of it, anything of value, one and a half million, and totaling up all of your debts equals just a half million. That's your mortgages, automobile debt, credit card debt, everything. All right, so you've got one and a half million in assets and 500K in debt, so you've got a million dollar net worth. Okay, well, next, say that you decide to pay down 100K of your debt. All right, well, what's the result? You've got only $1.4 million in assets and just four hundred dollars in debt. Well, the result is that your net worth is still a million bucks. You've now got fewer assets and less debt. So you just broke even, but it could be worse than just a break even. Because what if one month after you made this debt pay down, you now need that hundred k back for living expenses but you can no longer get it returned to you because you lost your job so no one will qualify you for a loan again. Or you still have your job, but lending standards have tightened and changed. Now your 100K is on the other side of a wall that you can't access. So debt pay down isn't just a question of net worth, it's liquidity. And there are some more layers here that we're going to get into. Paying down mortgage debt, it also builds home equity. Well, that is usually a bad thing because, as I'm known for saying, home equity is unsafe, illiquid, and its rate of return is always zero. Do you know the crowd that sometimes forgets this and really gets penalized? It is seniors, retirees. All right, what happens when a person is older and they've had a paid off home for a while? People get a reverse mortgage. They need funds for living expenses. Well, reverse mortgages, they have high fees. And also, you can't get nearly all of your equity out. You'll often only get up to 60 to 65% loan to value, meaning that 35 to 40% of that hard-earned equity that you worked decades for, first it became trapped with no return, and now it's essentially gone. Poof. For all those years, your home is paid off, even if it began as early as your 30s, like it does for some people, all that time, your equity wasn't earning any rate of return. And the earlier in life you learn that the ROI from home equity is always zero, the better. You didn't see any bill for this loss. You just never saw the gain that you should have had. And that's part of the reason why this myth that home equity is such a great thing perpetuates and carries on for generations. All right, well, we are just getting warmed up here on a key financial question in your life. That question is, 
is every debt that you have worth paying off? Did you know millions of Americans live with debt they cannot control? That's why I developed this unique new program for managing your debt. It's called Don't Buy Stuff You Cannot Afford. Oh, let me see that. If you don't have any money, you should not buy anything. Hmm, sounds interesting. Sounds confusing. <laughs> well, there's a little something to be said for that, but what about interest rate? If that 100 k that you paid down was for credit card debt, all right, well, that was probably a good thing. 44% of American credit card holders carry debt month to month. Now, I'm going to guess for you, the GRE listener, it's even less likely than that, that you carry debt month per month where you would be subject to credit card finance charges. The average credit card interest rate in America is about 25% today, and it is unsecured debt, meaning that it's a debt type that's not backed by collateral. Now, yes, you can beat a 25% return if you're leveraged in real estate, but your liquid cash flow drain is drastic on credit cards. The other problems with credit cards is that you have to pay your own debt. Later, I'll talk about when others pay your debt for you. And if you have decided that you have some debts worth paying down because its interest rate is too high, for goodness sake, pay the one with the highest interest rate first. I know there's a school of thought that says pay the debt with the lowest balance first. That is nonsense. Now, sometimes if you know specifically what you're doing with credit cards, you can play some little games with them. I mean, personally, after I finished college, I kept transferring credit card balances with 0% APR intro offers, introductory offers that were for a limited time at 0%. And then I kept track of that so that intro rate didn't expire. But this isn't any sort of long-term wealth building strategy. Higher balance transfer fees have made that strategy less lucrative now too. Banks have tightened that up. When it comes to interest rates, it's about that arbitrage. Ask yourself really two questions when it comes to arbitrage, which is just a fancy sounding way of making a profit or a spread. First, you need to ask yourself, how good of an investor are you? What percent return can you reliably earn from your investments? Say you think it's 15%. Then if you're plus 15, but the interest rate on your debt is 8 well, then you've got seven points of arbitrage or profit, so keep the 8% debt. And then secondly, on arbitrage plays, ask yourself, can I afford the cash flow if I keep this debt around? Because if you're 15% return, just say that it's all tied up in the appreciation of a property, well, that's not very liquid, so you're going to need to have the free cash to make the payments on your 8% interest rate loan. Let's talk about other times not to pay down the debt. Say you're trying to build up an emergency fund of at least three months, or you want to contribute to your employer match in your company's retirement plan. You may very well want to fund those things before you pay down debt too. Now, some say, hey, you know something? Just forget about all these numbers like rates of return and interest rates. You know, debt just makes me feel anxiety and feel stress and sleeplessness. There is emotion here. So let me just get it paid off. Or I'm afraid that if I've got some money and I don't pay off my debt, that I'll just lose all of the money to sports gambling. And to that, I say, come on, be an adult, set some boundaries, dog ear some cash for entertainment and have a firm line. Learn how to use debt to your advantage. Debt is like fire. It can burn you if you don't know how to use it, and it can heat your home if you do know how to use it. And if debt gives you sleeplessness, here, this will help you sleep. Your debt's principal balance is being debased for you as you sleep. Every single one of your debts is being eroded by inflation right now as you listen to me, your principal balance is quietly 
debasing and passively eroding. With your, say, 500K of total debt, we have 10% inflation over a couple years. Well, that erodes its weight down to 450K, all without you having to get involved and make any paydowns at all. As wages go higher, and so do prices and rents and salaries, as they all spiral higher, it gets easier to pay back those principal balances, and debt is the most powerful wealth-building force that I know of because debt is leverage. Compound interest is weak. Leverage is powerful. Debt allows you to own and control five times as many properties as you could if they were all paid off. And if you don't understand this, or if your jaw hit the floor, what I just said a minute ago, that compound interest is weak, I just discussed this for you in clear detail nine weeks ago on Get Rich Education Podcast, episode 507. So go and check that out. One attribute of real estate debt is that as you get properties where the rent income meets or exceeds the expenses, congratulations, you have reliably outsourced all of your debt payments to tenants. See, most of my debt, personally, virtually all of it, it isn't really going to be paid back by me. It's my tenants. And that is another reason to keep debt in place and only make the minimum payment. Let's talk about another reason to pay down your debt when a payoff or pay down actually does make sense, even if it's at a low interest rate, it's when an outside force kind of makes you pay down your debt. And here's what I'm talking about. Say you're trying to buy a property, whether that's a primary residence or a rental, and that you've got, say, oh, just $11,000 left to pay on your car loan at a 5% interest rate. Well, even though you can't outsource the payments, that's a pretty nice low 5% interest rate. You're confident that you can beat that and earn more elsewhere, so you'd rather enjoy the positive arbitrage instead of paying that off, and I'd feel the same way, but here's the twist. Your mortgage loan officer says you've got to pay the $11,000 down to zero because your debt-to-income ratio is too high. So if you want the mortgage, the big loan amount, you've got to pay off the car loan, the little loan amount. Well, that's a case when it makes sense to pay off that automobile loan debt then. And also, when it comes to your credit score, you might need to improve it to qualify for another loan so you can get a low interest rate. And 30% of your FICO score is made up of your amounts owed. I'm answering a vital question for you today, and that is, is every one of your debts worth paying off? I'm sharing information, perspective, and experience with you here. And this experience was built, just like all experiences, and I didn't always had the experience, of course. Now, my parents and I split my college loan costs 50-50. I still had student loan debts for a few years after graduating. And, you know, I can't remember what my student loan interest rates were. Maybe 6% blended because I had a few different student loans, some of which I did transfer onto those 0% intro APR credit cards, by the way. But after my student loans were paid off and I started investing in real estate and understanding terms like leverage and arbitrage, you know, I started to wonder if it would be desirable to have those student loans back. Rather than paying them off so fast, I could have owned another property or two sooner and I'll never know the opportunity cost of not benefiting from the returns on owning more property sooner and of course, student loan debt is one of the few debt types that cannot be written off in bankruptcy. That tilts back a little toward paying them off sooner than later. What you just heard me talk about here for the last 15 or so minutes is a message that hundreds of millions of people need to hear. It's that not every debt is worth paying off or even paying down. So to help give you a summary answer to our question, is every debt worth paying off? 
The answer is no. And the key considerations are liquidity, interest rate, arbitrage, and your ability to outsource the debt. Debt is good when it helps you buy a cash flowing asset or create arbitrage. Debt is probably even good when it helps you buy a home for your family and have a sense of permanency and a mantle to place baseballs and hang Christmas stockings from and build memories. And now this is all because every single one of us either uses debt or we forego the opportunity to use debt. Well, when we forego using debt, we are now subject to a resultant opportunity cost. And this is why a central and enduring mantra here at GRE is that financially free beats debt free. Financially free means that you have enough residual income streams to meet all of your expenses and live just how you want to live. Debt free means that you don't owe anyone anything, but if you put debt free before financially free, you are going to grind and live below your means and eat dirt and miss opportunities for decades. And speaking of leveraging your way to financial freedom with assets, the way that we accidentally help you here is by recommending income producing providers and properties for you. And you probably noticed over time that GRE marketplace properties here are less expensive than elsewhere. And you might wonder why exactly is this? Well, there's a few reasons. Investor advantage markets have low prices. Also, there is no agent. You get to buy directly. Thirdly, providers provide homes in bulk, keeping your costs down. And then finally, there are no owner-occupied emotions involved here with buying and owning rental properties. So you don't have sellers that are making unreasonable requests. So this helps answer why GRE marketplace properties are often good deals. Now, it seems like states with the best cash flow in real estate are the same ones where people are more likely to wear bib overalls. <laughs> and that's just how it is. <laughs> in fact, hey, case in point, I just learned about some brand new, new build single family rentals in Southwest Missouri at GRE Marketplace. They're available for you to own regardless of where you live. They make ideal rentals and they come with free property management for the first year. And because they're freshly built, expect the likelihood of a quality tenant, light maintenance, and low repair costs for years. Let me just quickly mention two of them to give you a feel. The first one is in Carthage, Missouri. The single family rental is three bed, two bath, rent $1,550. The price is $206K. It's 1,200 square feet, built this year. You get a $1,200 rent credit with it. So it's going to take a 51K down payment and it produces cash flow. The second one is in Carl Junction, Missouri. Four bed, two baths in this single family rental. The rent's $1,875. The price, $250,000. $500, 1,683 square feet built this year, 62K down and produces cash flow. And like I said, both come with free property management for the first year. And we can help set up an entire real estate investment plan for you, whether it's with these properties or others in multiple states where we help you make it easy on yourself and contact a GRE investment coach. It is truly free. Always, there aren't going to be any hidden coaching bills that pop up in the mail. We don't have some paid coaching program we're trying to upsell you. We don't have anything to sell. And our coaches are like advisors, consultants, super connectors, and like silent partners on your deals. And they get zero equity in the deal. And our coaches don't wear bib overalls either, so they keep it really relatable for you. <laughs> make it actionable and make a real difference in your life. Start at GREMarketplace.com. That's where you can contact a GRE investment coach, and we'll see how we can help you out. From GREMarketplace.com, just click on the free investment coaching button. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Whitehold, and I'll be back to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. 
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.